Institute of Communicable Diseases has discovered a new C12 COVID-19 variant. The new C12 variant has a considerable number of mutations and has the potential to become a variant of concern. The research body says that whilst the Delta variant has driven the third wave of infections in the country, the C12 could become the dominant variant in the fourth wave. <laughs> The so-called C12 variant was first identified in May in South African provinces of uh, Mpumalanga and Gauteng. The variant has since been found in seven other countries in Africa, Oceania, Asia and as well as Europe. The NICD says that the mutations on the virus are associated with increased transmissibility and an increased ability to evade antibodies. It's highly unlikely, it seems, that the new variant will halt the current administration of vaccines. Well, for the latest, uh, we're now joined by the National Institute for Communicable Diseases Acting Executive Director, Professor Adrian Purin. Uh, Prof, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Welcome to the program. Good evening, Peter, and to your viewers. Thanks for the, the opportunity to be on your show. All right, so we can't keep up as uh, citizens uh, on the number of variants that are out there. Um, I thought D was the last one, and we've gone back to C. How does that work? It's just the, the nomenclature that I think the, um, the CDC um, and, and, and sorry, the, the various bodies use to um, identify and label so that it's best understood where in the sequence of events this particular variant um, would, would resi reside. And again, I, I think it's important to note that it, this is a derivative of a, another variant that was in circulation. Um, but this particular variant has accumulated a whole series of mutations um, that has led to our probably publishing this particular work in the interest of, of transparency. It may lead nowhere, but it's, it's important to note that we have identified this variant. It has mutations that, that could be of concern when you look at it in, in total, totality. However, there's still a lot of that we need to still learn about this um, in terms of whether or not those mutations are really critical in terms of so-called transmissibility, um, so-called pathogenicity, as well as immune um, evasion as, as well. So what typically are we saying when we talk about some mutations? Uh, is it a significant departure from uh, the original virus or um, still within the family so that the um, vaccines are quite likely still to, to work? Yes, yeah, so from a theoretical um, perspective, the vaccine should um, still work. When you look at what has occurred in this particular um, variant or lineage is that it's accumulated mutations that we see in um, variants of concern or variants of, of interest. So in other words, it's a combination of what we see in different um, other lineages. And those particular mutations, it certainly has other unique mutations that are uh, of concern, but certainly those mutations that are, we've noted in the variants of concern and of, of interest, certainly um, we've seen these in terms of escape, escape, muta escape mutations, as well as a great degree of, of transmissibility. Our sense from a theoretical perspective is that the current vaccines um, should still um, significantly um, lead to a decrease in the, in the transmission of this, these particular um, variants. So I think um, this will be known, I think, in the next few weeks, at least, whether that, that does certainly pan out. So I think it's really, again, I, I, again we don't want to panic the, the public at all. It's just really noting that, indeed, these variants do arise and they will continue to arise. And there will be ad adaptability, perhaps, and or particular changes which will allow us or require us to change our vaccine um, constructs, for example. But at this stage, we don't need to panic. I think it's there. It's certainly increasing in numbers. If you look over the last few, few uh, months, that there has been a steady increase in the numbers of um, genes that we've, uh, in terms of the number of viruses that we've been able to isolate with, with belonging to this particular variant. So I think we just need to keep an eye on that and, and see what the, the developments are. If you recall a few months back, um, we noticed a few cases of Delta and look what's happened to Delta in South Africa. It's become the dominant variant. So, I think, so it's a similar principle that we've identified this particular variant Let's see what the, what the outcomes are. So we talk about Gauteng and Mpumalang as, as uh, where we see it the most. Does that give us a clue as to where it first came or originated, first mutated? 
Not necessarily. I think that there are ways in which um, these particular viruses are um, detected. In other words, it's based on uh, patients presenting to various hospitals or clinics. And so there, there may well be other individuals who may have started off somewhere else, but perhaps that is the starting point and then transmission occurring from there. But it's just the way in which the sampling is done. And again, the more you sample, the more likely you are to certainly detect these particular variants of, uh, of, of interest, for example, or of concern. So I think it, it, it's not necessarily that it arose in the like It may well have done, but it may have arose in somewhere else because, as you know, that the transmission is not necessarily symptomatic and, and or that a person may not necessarily present for um, PCR detection because they have symptoms. So those are the ways in which there are limitations to the way in which we sample and detect for, for variants. So is, is uh, South Africa where it was detected for the first time in the world? I'm not aware of, of that. Again, you know, sometimes we can have um, mutations or variants arising that may arise in different parts of the world, but it's possible that it could have arisen here, just as you know, the, the beta variant, for example, certainly arose or was certainly detected first in South Africa and then was spread out from there. It's, it seems to be heading for a dead end in, in some particular countries as Delta becomes the dominant um, variant. So what are the researchers trying to establish then? So what these researchers are trying to establish now is, for example, is this variant based on the mutations that we currently have observed from the sequences? Does that lead to, for example, the, the, the effects that we would likely see, for example? Will there be, for example, escape uh, from neutralization? So again, one could look at um, individuals' plasmas from individuals that have been vaccinated and test it against that particular variant and see what the extent is of neutralization of that particular variant in cell culture, for example. Or if, if one could look at um, how, um, how transmissible this particular virus, virus is, one could use particular cell lines uh, that have the S2 receptor and see what the extent is of, of transmission, or at least in terms of replication versus other uh, virus or wild type viruses, for example, and see whether or not rates of transmission are, are any different. But again, transmission from an epidemiological perspective may be different from what we see from a laboratory. So again, if in an epidemiological context, if there's um, the possibility for transmission, then that will certainly occur. And again, we really focus on the NPIs, for example, non-pharmaceutical interventions still remain a key part to controlling the transmission, as well as the fact that we do now have a, a very potent tool and that's the, the vaccine, and that is what we really need to encourage people to do. And that's the one way in which we can control four variants is by vaccinating as large a number of our population as we can. I, I guess it's too early to tell uh, just how many people are being hospitalized and perhaps are dying of this new variant. I think it's, it's very difficult. I mean, again, I think we should just really be cautious. I think our idea was really to alert and the public, and we've also alerted the, the WHO, that we have observed this particular variant um, in circulation. And again, in South Africa, as you know, not everyone, uh, everyone who presents for PCR has their particular virus uh, sequenced. However, uh, under certain circumstances, and, we, and we've seen particular countries where the capacity is there and that is available, one can certainly do sequencing, um, especially to determine whether or not these particular variants are associated with um, high pathogenicity um, or transmissibility, then one would certainly be able to, to sequence that in order to compare with previously circulating um, variants. So that's not done as a routine um, in, in South Africa. What is interesting is that uh, it seems that a new variant seems to drive the next wave. What happens to the old variants? Do we develop some kind of immunity or what happens that a new one seems to be taking over? Well, in, in essay, they, they get displaced. So in other words, if you look at those beautiful curves um, or graphs that have been generated, and you can just see how initially that it was the beta um, that was really the dominant uh, virus in circulation, followed by um, the presence of, of Delta, for example. So those viruses may well be displaced. They may become a smaller proportion, if not die out or become extinct, for example. Um, so they, they then get replaced by the next dominant um, variant. So that's 
probably what we may well see in the future as well as we vaccinate and as and if the virus is still in circulation and being transmitted, then we may well see you know, small pockets of these particular variants or new variants, and they may well be different to what mm. we're currently seeing. They may be even more transmissible, more pathogenic than what we're currently seeing, or um, the other way around. They may well have adapted as we become adapted to this particular virus. Help me understand uh, how this virus... I um, mean, it, it, you know, we wash our hands, it disappears in theory. Um, how, how is it duplicating? Well, how, I mean, does it, does it hatch? What does it do? How does it become so many? Well, this applies to two all viruses. So a virus, um, again, has a whole series of philosophical arguments where this is a living um, organism. Nevertheless, viruses need a cell to replicate in. So it uses its particular machinery. So, for example, this particular virus has only a receptor. That it, uh, sorry, it does have the, what is called the spike protein that binds to a specific receptor, the ACE2 receptor, and that's on the human cell, for example. So you have the virus binding, so it's a lock and key mechanism. It's able to enter, and then it uses its particular machinery to replicate, and then the virus is reassembled and released, and then it infects the next cell. But you can imagine... When you're in that particular drop, there may be millions of viral particles, live, uh, viable viral particles being transmitted in the uh, atmosphere as aerosols or droplets. These end up on your mucosal epithelium. They bind and through this lock and key mechanism and then replicate and then gets released. And then as you sneeze or cough, that virus is then transmitted to the next individual. And as you know, we speak about the so-called R naught. So if the R, at the effective R, for example, is three, then that person who is now infected releases its drop. It can then affect an additional three persons. And in fact, as you know, the Delta is even more um, effective in terms of its transmissibility. So it can affect a wide range of, of individuals. All right, so final word, not to worry or panic, a lot of work is still being done in terms of researching, but we should just carry on vaccinating and following the protocols. Yes, I think this was a demonstration, or this is a demonstration, of the power of the molecular tools and the role of these powerful molecular tools in terms of monitoring, monitoring this particular epidemic. Because if this gets upgraded, if you like, um, in terms of affecting multiple countries, large numbers of people affecting vaccine efficacy or effectiveness, for example, then it does become the variant of, of concern and then the variant of, uh, yeah, the variant of concern. But at this particular point, it's not on any of the WHO's list in terms of it's recognized by the WHO, but it's not at that point where um, there's a great deal of information for us to make certain um, decisions because it's limited in its uh, spread at this particular point, but we need to keep an eye on and see how um, this particular virus, what its uh, trajectory is. And if it does change, then obviously we need to be ready for that particular change again. Professor Adrian Furin, your insights always greatly appreciated. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. Thank you. All right, so uh, that's C12, a new variant that's uh, been discovered in South Africa since May. And uh, the word is that they're looking at it, doing research, but we don't need to worry or stress about it in the meantime.